Hi everyone and welcome back into January 2020 and US Open Live. I'm Dave Giancola, joined as always by Ned Michaels. Happy New Year, my Happy friend. Happy New Year to you. Well, the calendar has flipped. It is 2020 and that means the countdown is officially on to Father's Day weekend at Wingfoot for the 120th playing of the United States Open Championship. And Ned, right out of the gate, the PGA Tour season has opened up. And we all know that the week-to-week -week PGA Tour season has a lot of implications for the U.S. Open because the U.S. Open is just that. It is open and players can play themselves in week to week. So Ned, with that said, who is hot out of the gate on the PGA Tour? Who do you like? Well, I appreciate you throwing me a nice little softball <laughs> right out of the gate here in 2020. It's Justin Thomas. Yeah. Of course, he's already won twice this season. He won in Hawaii in a limited field, but a terrific field at Kapalua. He's doing everything well except putting. His putting stats, especially in that four to eight foot range where you need to be exquisite and almost perfect to win at Wingfoot, He's almost near the bottom. He's 199th on the PGA Tour. But think about it. If he's already won twice and he's not putting well, think about if he starts to make a few putts. Watch out for Justin Thomas. Yeah, two wins already on the PGA Tour season, so you can sense it's going to be a big 2020 for JT. But, Ned, we know a lot of big-name players. They're already exempt into the U.S. Open. They're already booking their, their hotels, their houses <laughs> up in Mamaroneck, New York. But there's a lot of players that haven't played their way in yet, and you know they want to get there. Who's someone that may not be exempt yet, but you think may actually be a favorite come Father's Day? Well, in terms of favorites, the way that I looked at this wasn't necessarily favorites, but guys who were exempt who, when they get in, win. And I promise you they're going to right. get in. These are players to keep an eye on. Uh, South African Eric Van Ruyen. A couple of times he's won on the European Tour. He finished in the top 20 the last two times he's played the Open Championship. He had a top 45 finish at the U.S. Open last year, but he is a guy who is, in terms of ball striking, is a top 10 caliber player. Keep an eye on Eric Van Ruyen. There's also a Frenchman, Victor Perez. His last few events, he finished second in Abu Dhabi, tied for second in Turkey, fourth at the World Golf Championship, and he won the Alfred Dunhill Lynx Championship, which is one of the biggest events on the European Tour. He is a prodigious striker of the ball high ball flight hits it a long way these are elements of a game that you need to be able to handle at wing foot but the one player the one player i want you to keep an eye on a former u.s amateur champion man who finished tied for 12th last year at the united states open victor hovland a norwegian knight this guy can do anything if he's not hitting it well he can chip and he can putt if he's putting well he's always going to hit the ball halfway decent if he puts it all together he literally can win a major at any given time. He hasn't won on tour yet. Keegan Bradley, remember 2011, he won in his first major championship. It wouldn't be the first for Hovland, but it wouldn't surprise me at all if he came into Wingfoot and at least poked his nose into contention. Yeah, Victor Hovland kind of turning into a household name in professional golf, wins that U.S. Amateur two years ago at Pebble Beach, returns to Pebble Beach with that exemption from yes. being a U.S. Amateur champion and plays extremely, extremely well, taking home low amateur honors and the medal during that uh, incredible award ceremony at Pebble Beach. And you know the ball striking's there for Victor Hovland if he can perform well with those small greens at Pebble Beach. So talking about household names. Mm -hmm. I want to dive in to some of the biggest name players in the game and what the keys for them will be if they are to emerge victorious as the 120th U.S. Open champion. And I want to start with the most household name, and that's Tiger Woods. The big cat. <laughs> well, of course he can get it done. He is the reigning Masters champion. He won. And it didn't look like he was playing all that well, the PGA Championship last year. And then at the U.S. Open Pebble Beach, he was not in good health, you could tell. But towards the end of the year, he wins on the PGA Tour. He wins the Zozo Championship in Japan, and he looked good and healthy and strong yep. doing it. If he stays healthy, watch out for Tiger. Yeah, I think that word strong you use, when he is looking strong, Ooh, yeah. that's when you think the health will hold up, and then you know anything is possible with one of the greatest players of all time. Let's move in uh, to Mr. John Rahm, the former Arizona State Sun Devil. You know he can strike the ball. He can hit it a long way. Not necessarily kind of a long hitter's paradise up there at wing foot. you got to have precision. What's the key for the Spaniard? Listen, John, talking directly to you, don't do anything different. Keep doing what you're doing. 
People say that you have to be able to control your attitude, control your emotions better. Keep being you because he is on course to win majors and Wingfoot certainly within his reach. Yeah, John Rahm, I think everyone's expecting him to break through at a major Absolutely. championship no very, question. very soon. Uh, talking about major championship winners, the 2015 U.S. Open champion at Chambers Bay in the Pacific Northwest was none other than Jordan Spieth. What about Mr. Spieth? What does he need to do well to emerge at Wingfoot? I'm worried about Jordan. Really? I'm, I'm, I'm worried about him in the sense of you always hear the old adage is it starts at the green and goes backwards. If you're putting poorly, it erodes your short game. And then your iron play starts to atrophy. And before you know it, you're putting more pressure on your driver. For Jordan, it's almost the opposite. In 2015, he made everything. You can't expect that. But now he's driving the ball so poorly that it's starting to ooze its way into the rest of his game. He has to be able to hit fairways. You cannot win at Wingfoot missing fairways, period, on the sentence. You just can't do it. Correct. And, and so you talk about him, Spieth, he's got to improve there. His good friend JT, we talked about that. Two wins already on the PGA Tour. We touched on it. The putting's got to improve, right? Wingfoot's green's notoriously difficult to read. The undulations are just incredible. It, it's really an architectural masterpiece up there in Westchester County. Let's touch on our defending champion, Gary Woodland. He put it all together over 72 holes at Pebble Beach. He capped it off with a putt that a lot of us are never going to forget and a reaction from an incredible crowd out there uh, in California. What does our defending champ need to improve on to maybe go back to back like his friend Brooks Kepka? Well, the most glaring element of his game is his short game, and it's just an overall statistics. He's way down the list in terms of outside the top 180 in short game conversion up and down. But I don't necessarily think that's the most important part because that takes into account all of the short game. For, there are two things for Gary Woodland. He's got to get a little bit better on short-sided, deep bunker shots because those bunkers at Wingfoot, they're yawning caverns. And you have to be able to get it up quickly and drop it softly. He gets steep on his bunker shots sometimes. He exposes that leading edge. And he has a little bit of trouble controlling his trajectory, his elevation. So that would be number one. And then number two, he just needs to continue down the same path of being comfortable working the ball both directions. Because at wing foot, you have to be able to draw and fade shots. And Woodland is primarily a predominantly left to right player, even though over the past year, year and a half, he's become more comfortable with the draw. This is something he just needs to be able to under pressure count on. So shot making for Gary Woodland, you talk about the deep bunkers and one hole that certainly comes to mind when you think of deep green side bunkers is the par three tenth hole. The, you know, the, every U.S. Open, there are holes where you just stand, have to stand up and hit a shot. In the tenth hole, there's, there are a lot of them at Wingfoot, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but the tenth hole is certainly one of those because there's nowhere to miss right, there's nowhere to miss left. And even if you get it on the green, there's a still a lot of work left to do. Yeah, it is one of the most iconic holes at Wingfoot. A.W. Tillinghast, the architect at Wingfoot, called it perhaps the best par three he ever built, which is high praise coming from an architect with that type of resume. Let's take a deeper dive into the par three tenth and join Michael Breed and Wingfoot golf professional Katie Weedmar. The 10th tee at Wingfoot Golf Club, the host of the 2020 U.S. Open. One of my favorite par threes, and I'm joined by Katie Weedmar. And Katie, PGA professional, you spend a lot of time looking out over this tee. The pro shop is just over there, which we'll get to in a second. But this hole right here just reeks of Tillinghast. One of my favorite par threes, and in fact, he said of all the par threes he designed, this was his favorite. Absolutely, and uh, even Ben Hogan has that famous uh, quote that he uses where it's a three iron into someone's back window. Yeah, and look at that house. I'm very fortunate this is my office view window, so I have no complaints. Speaking of that, let's move on back to where they've, they've uh, added this additional tee. And as we go by, we go past the golf shop where obviously Claude Harmon, and we remember Cl Claude as a, a, a Masters champion, but also in 1959, he finished third in the U.S. Open while he was the host golf professional. A very, very challenging and daunting thing to do. Let's go back onto this tee and just give the, the uh, individuals watching an idea of what this looks like from back here because this is really challenging. It's 195 up there, can play as much as what, 225, 230? Yeah. yeah, it can play very challenging, about 215, 230. And, and, and also what seems to make this shot challenging is 
it looks like you want to hit a little bit of a cut shot in here, don't you? Absolutely, especially where that pin is today. And yet, as you start to do that, you now bring that bunker in on the right-hand side, and that bunker is extremely deep. The green is very, very challenging. We want to show you what that green looks like. So, Katie, why don't you and I head on up to the green, and you all come on with us. Let's do it. So as we start to approach the front edge of the green here, Katie, obviously we can feel this property moving down to the right-hand side, and there are a lot of divots down there, clearly a collection area. Yeah, a few balls have made its way down there yeah, before. Yeah, none of yours, right? No, Your never, golf never. ball doesn't My get down there. My balls are on the green. Exactly, so we get up here to the green, and what we notice, obviously, is a very narrow little opening in here, and then it kind of broadens in the back, but what is right in our mind is this bunker to the right-hand side, a typical Tillinghast bunker. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run down there and I'm gonna give them a little look at what it looks like when you're sitting in a Tillinghast bunker on the 10th green, and then we'll get to you in your putting. Now, yeah, I'm gonna stay up at the green. You go do that. That a girl. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about this. I think it was Dave Marr who said that he spent so much time in these bunkers that he had his mail delivered over here. Now, I'm not sending my mail, but I am, I am interested in showing you exactly what it's like when you get down here into a Tillinghast bunker because the first thing that you're gonna notice is you can only see about half the flag stick. You don't really have an accurate idea of where that green has started and the challenges of it, and this is challenging. In fact, Yeah, it was a little challenging. You know what? You don't want to hit it here, let me tell you. There's a lot of other places that you want to be. In fact, you know where you want to be now? You want to be up on the green with Katie. Not too shabby down there, Michael. Now, even though I hit the green up here, that doesn't always mean I'm making par. This green is very treacherous, even though it doesn't show as, as severe breaks as some of the other holes. Back in 06, Ogilvy was fortunate enough to birdie the holes during the first and third round. We'll see if that's the case for these players in 2020 now that that tee's extended a little further back. So as for me, unfortunately I hit the ball above the hole, so I've got a tough putt ahead of me. I barely just want to breathe on this thing. Let's see how we turn out here. All right, now as it's coming down, it's gaining speed, and all I want to do is just snuggle it tight near the hole. I thought it was going to drop in. My caddy was going to you know, pick it up I was from gonna, the hole. You, that's good. Pick that up. That, well, right. but not in the U.S. Open. You're going to be making that. It's a really, really fun hole, obviously. One of the reasons why Tilling has called this his favorite par three. As they move that tee back, this is going to be one of those shots that if you're starting out your round, it's going to be extremely difficult. You've got to commit to your shot and trust your golf swing. All right, thank you as always to Michael and Katie for taking us in depth into Wingfoot's West Course. We can't wait to get up there for the U.S. Open Championship. And if you can't tell, Ned, the one thing Wingfoot doesn't lack is history. So we want to take a trip back in time for this segment to 1959. And believe it or not, it was the first time the U.S. Open was played over four days it was due to weather because the players used to play 36 holes on Saturday and then the championship was over. But weather pushed it to Sunday and that's about the least interesting fact we're going to touch on because there's a lot of them from 1959. And it all started the final round. Let's set the scene. 46 year old Ben Hogan in second place, three back of Billy Casper. And many of the journalists of that era and of that day would tell you that Ben Hogan would have won his fifth, his record-setting United States Open, had it not been for the rain delays, the start and stoppage of play, and of course, his body was still mangled from the car accident, but it was because it went another day. It gave Billy Casper the chance to close down this championship, and at the time, he wasn't a 51-time tour winner. He wasn't a five-time Varden Award winner. He was just Billy Casper, the kid from San Diego. But boy, did he know how to get it done. He wasn't the longest hitter in the era. Nicholas outdrove him. Palmer was longer. Even Trevino, more prodigious off of the tee. But Billy Casper, he knew how to get the ball into the hole. Right. And I think it came down to course management, which we all know a player needs to win the U.S. Open. But I think Billy Casper really showcases that back in 59. Get this. On the par 3 third hole, 217 yards. You said he wasn't the longest hitter. He said... The fairway woods were feeling a little erratic that week. So what did he do? He laid up on the par three third four straight days, 
all four rounds, got up and down each round for par. That is course management to a T. What a, what a wonderful window into the mind of Billy Casper, who is probably one of the most underrated winners ever on the PGA Tour, but the world of golf, really. He was top 10 right now, 51 wins again on the PGA Tour. But the fact that he could lay up on a par three and have that much confidence in his short game, it just shows you the IQ this man had. And Dave, what it tells me is you don't have to overpower Wingfoot. This is a golf course that if you have the right strategy and you can stay the course and not be affected by bogeys here and there, if you think your way around this place, you can win this U.S. Open. Well, you certainly have to think through it, and I think the course may have been in some players' heads in the final round, because how's this for a fact? The course yielded zero <laughs> subpar rounds in the final round. That is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. As good as the players are, to not have any rounds under par, it's, it's unthinkable. It's unimaginable. It really, it really is. It just, it, it's, a, it's a tip of the cap to the golf course and, and how difficult it can be, but I want to punch counterpunch with you here a little bit. All right. Of the last four winners to win the United States Open at this venue, Winged Foot, only twice have they made a single double bogey or higher for the entire championship. When Casper won, zero. No scores of double bogey or higher. Irwin only made one. Fuzzy only made one. And Ogilvy also the goose egg. So it's, it, it really is this balancing act that is Winged Foot. Is you understand... Under par is fantastic, but you also know in the back of your brain you have to avoid the big numbers if you want to win at the end of the week. And I think that's a common thread we hear from players these days, right? Par is your friend. Avoid the blow-up holes, the big numbers. So that was it. Casper, the first of his three major titles, he would go on to win the 1966 U.S. Open and the 1970 Masters. So, Ned, thank you for joining us today. And before we let you go, we have some exciting news here at the USGA. We have teamed up with award-winning actor Don Cheadle to champion public golf and environmental sustainability. He's a huge fan, a huge player of the game, and he wants to make sure everyone is doing it responsibly. As part of the partnership, though, he's also getting you hyped for the U.S. Open and has some awesome videos on the way, one of which you may have already seen if you were watching the NFC playoffs on Fox, but if you haven't, enjoy. Around here, we like blood, sweat, and tears. Served up with a side of blood, sweat, and more tears. What'd you think I was talking about? <laughs> <laughs>